Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're joined by Dr. Jamie Turmdorf, who has been known to millions as Dr. Love. She is a radio and television personality who has been delighting audiences for more than three decades with her engaging blend of professional expertise and spicy humor. Her success is largely due to her remarkable ability to turn clinical psychobabble into entertaining and easy-to-understand concepts that transforms lives. But today I think you're going to be very surprised by that remarkable introduction to discover that she herself has discovered that love never dies. That is the title of her new book. It's how to reconnect and make peace with the deceased. And I'd like to welcome to Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Jamie Turndorf. Jamie, Hello. thank you for joining us here on the program today. Hello, nice to be with you. Now, this is quite a story. You know, we've actually featured this particular topic here on the program, and I've got to tell you, this is something that a lot of people really want to know about. Mm-hmm. A, obviously, is there really life after death? And B, if so, is it possible to connect with the deceased, mm-hmm. especially loved ones? And you yourself have firsthand accounts that, mm-hmm. yes, this is very possible. Tell us about that. Well, first I have to give you a little background, if I may, leading up to my amazing discovery that we don't die. May I? Well, that's what you're here for, Dr. Right. Love. <laughs> okay, honey. So first I have to tell everybody, because people, you know, if you haven't read the book, and I don't talk about my personal story on my Ask Dr. Love show or at my website, well, when I was a young girl, I had a premonition of the guy I was going to marry. I saw his face. I saw his body. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to date. I'm going to wait until this guy I see in my mind's eye appears. And he actually did appear on the first day of my freshman year at Vassar College. I'd been shut out of all intro sociology, and I wanted to take sociology, so I asked the secretary, Judy Cadwallader, how can I take intro soci? And she said, go ask the department chair, Jean Pain, if he can find a seat for you in one of the closed classes. Well, the minute I stepped into his office, I had the first and only out-of-body experience of my life. I literally felt my soul shooting at high speed through a tunnel to the end of my life. Then I shot back into my body, and I received the message, remember every aspect of this meeting, he is going to be everything to you one day. And then I forgot about it and went about my life as a college student at Vassar. Now, soon after meeting Jean, I was told that for most of his life, he had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests in history. He had taught at the Vatican, and he founded a movement called Liberation Theology designed to fight church oppression from within. Now, he launched to international fame when he publicly opposed the Pope and the Catholic Church as they were trying to block the legalization of divorce. And being a radical feminist Jesuit priest, he didn't want to see women trapped in marriages where they were being abused. So he fought on the grounds of liberation theology, the movement he founded, and he got the divorce bill passed, and he changed the course of Italian history. And soon after, the Pope granted him the dispensation of his vows so that he wasn't excommunicated, and he left the Jesuit order in the priesthood and was recruited by Vassar, where he had served for 10 years on the day that I met him. Now, everybody needs to know that my background is completely different. I was raised by two devoutly atheist Jewish parents. The only religion my parents practiced was religiously hating each other's guts and mine. So I was taught not to believe in God or the afterlife. I never went to church or synagogue or anything. So now in the senior year of my life at Vassar College, I needed help with the statistical portion of my thesis, and I had heard that, among other things, Jean had been a famous statistician, having founded the Vatican's first and only social research center. So I asked him, even though he wasn't my advisor, I said, will you help me with the statistical portion of my thesis? And he cheerfully gave me his time, and within a couple of weeks, we knew. We were crazy for each other. We were twins separated at birth. We were soulmates. So from that point on, for 27 years, we were inseparable. Now, in the last year of his bodily existence, we both started having premonitions that he was going to die of an accident. We just didn't know when or where it was going to happen. So we go to Italy on our final vacation, and one day while we're sitting on the beach, Jean's hand is up over his head as if to block the rays of the sun. The next thing I know, 
a bee swoops down and stings his left hand at the exact location of Christ's stigmata. And now I watch my beloved suffocate to death in front of my eyes. And in part one of Love Never Dies, I describe the absolute terror of having him ripped from me in this way. I go back to the hotel room. I'm lying on the bed. I'm shaking. I'm trembling. I'm crying. The next thing I know, I feel that man's hand stroke the entire length of my spine. I sit bolt upright. I look over my shoulder. I don't see anything, but I knew he was there. And he has been with me ever since. And his astonishing manifestations to this day, often in front of witnesses, have shown me we don't die, and therefore our relationships are not meant to end in death. And so I created what I call my groundbreaking new trans-dimensional grief therapy method, which completely diverges from the Western approach, which is grieve, let go, move on, do it in six months, or we're going to give you psychiatric labels and meds. This only leaves the bereaved at a greater loss. Instead, my method shows you how to say hello, not goodbye, without a channeler, without a medium, without a psychic. And then there's just one more thing. As a shrink, I know millions of people worldwide harbor unfinished business with those in spirit. And again, Western grief therapy gives us no way of working out unfinished business with someone who has left his body. So Love Never Dies also shows you how to use my dialoguing with the departed technique not only to reconnect, but also to work out and heal unfinished business with any being in spirit. Now, it's really interesting to note for the listeners out there as you talk about the Western modality Mm. of grief. And I found myself becoming irritated as you realize Mm. how often this so-called expertise seems to permeate through and be established as a stamped, it's finalized fact. Right. This is the way things are. And, right. and, and you know, it, it, it's so common nowadays, that especially if you're watching television and you begin to see the ads that come on that tell you about conditions that you may not have been aware of that are now <laughs> a reality and here's the fix <laughs> right? and so forth. But what's really funny are these so-called, and I, this is just my opinion, these stupid disorders these people come up with and then grieving is kind of now one of the most disorder. ridiculous areas that you could have some of these things in. Right, right, right. And now this is a medical condition. And if you haven't snapped out of it in six months, you've got <laughs> complicated grief disorder. and It's, it's, it's appalling. You know. So basically, in Love Never Dies, what I do is, you know, because I'm a perfect spokesperson for this reality, because I didn't believe in God or the afterlife. So in part one, what I do is I pick up from the night that Jean left his body, and I tell you what he has done to prove to me that he's here. So this is already helping people to say, wait a minute, if this happened to her, the atheist, you know, didn't believe in anything, maybe I can open my mind to the awareness that this could happen to me. Do you want me to share some of those examples? Yes, and, and what I was going to point out, too, is as you said, that you were raised by parents who were devout atheists, yes. and you believe uh, as a result of that in your own life, let's call that lack of theological training, if you will, or anything. that as you described in your book was probably the reason you were having these experiences. And here's what was interesting. Yeah. Again, I've done interviews on this subject over the years, and I came to a personal conclusion that people who tend to have these experiences, and this is just you know an opinion mm-hmm. again, like you have had, Mm-hmm. tend to be those that maybe really aren't so sure they believe in an afterlife. Absolutely. They have they lack the theological Absolutely. training and, and all this. And these are the people that tend to have these experiences more often than people who believe they've got that connection with and God. There's, so and there's speak. a reason for it, I've mm-hmm. come to discover, because the indoctrination that's pushed on us through organized religion is enough to cause people to close their eyes, ears, and all their senses to all the signs that are coming. Because if you're told, human beings' experiences gov- are governed by our expectations. So, for example, if you go to the dentist and you're told, oh, this procedure is going to hurt, well, you produce something called substance P, and that actually causes pain. So you expect pain, you have pain. Likewise, if you're told, listen, you can't connect with people in spirit, and you're raised to believe this from a young age, well, then you're going to close your eyes and ears and all your senses, and you are not going to see, hear, feel, smell, taste, and touch all the signs that are coming your way because mm-hmm. you're told you can't. You mm-hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's why, because I wasn't told one way or another 
he just came through like gangbusters. Mm-hmm. And I think it was interesting to talk about that. Uh, one of the big interviews that I did was probably back around 19, well, probably 2000, I want to say, and it was on a book called Afterlife Experiments. Oh yeah, and this, and I'm sure you're familiar. That was the work that they were actually going to have on the HBO television show to see if it was possible to connect and communicate with the afterlife. And so, as you begin to describe some of these examples about how the afterlife connects with us, the signs, the symbols, mm-hmm, how they go mm-hmm. about doing that, mm-hmm. anybody reading that particular book is going to find tears in their eyes at times because I was just astounded at some of those things that, as you were saying earlier in the program we tend to overlook because, well, the religious filter or curtain, if you will, has been dropped in front of our eyes and we don't see the miracles. <laughs> and it straight jackets you. So, I mean, I can share some of these experiences or I can move, you know, move on to helping people. I mean, we, we have time. We, we have can... some time to do that, absolutely. Right. This right. is Valentine's. This is Dr. Love's treat. Aww. There'll be no Gene Simmons and Kiss in the background on this one. <laughs> All right. So, so I'll pick up and I'll just give a few examples of part one of Love Never Dies. And then, of course, when you read the book, you'll get the sense of the whole flow of my discovery of his presence. So I pick up from the night that I felt him stroke my spine, okay? I come back from Italy. I'm alone for the first time in our house, you know, for decades. And I am sleepless the entire night. And I hear him quoting something to me. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute because what he was quoting is very significant. I come down the next morning and I hear him saying through thought induction, although at the time I didn't know that's what it's called (laughs) or mind melding. It's just I knew he was telling me, open the back door. I want to show you something. So I open the door and I see a little chipmunk sitting on the step. And it's obvious to me this chipmunk is not behaving normally. He's in a trance. His eyes are nearly closed. And he doesn't run away when I'm standing right in front of him. Next thing I know, he begins to mimic my husband's bodily departure. He starts choking and gasping and ripping at his face with his little hand, mimicking the way my husband was ripping at the oxygen mask because the air wasn't getting in. He was suffocating. And, of course, tears are pouring down my face as I'm watching this. And I'm weeping. And this is going on for 20 minutes when finally the little chipmunk visibly coughs up a wonk of mucus And he's in peace. And I knew even then that my husband was speaking to me through this open vessel. I've since called animals, both domestic and wild, open vessels because they're natural channels through which spirit speaks to us. He was showing me through this open vessel, I'm okay. Well, the next thing that happens is I have to fax his death certificate to the phone carrier Verizon. And I had sent many multi-page faxes throughout the day, no problem. But when I went to fax his death certificate, the cover letter faxes without a hitch. But then the death certificate hangs up. It won't go. The machine freezes. Now I try with the obit. Again, cover letter faxes without a hitch, but the obit won't go. I try 20 times. I give up. The next day I go to the lawyer's office carrying the papers. I do not say why. I just say, would you do me a favor and fax this to Verizon for me? I'm waiting and waiting, waiting and waiting. Finally, they all come out from the back office and they're all weeping. All the secretaries are weeping. They said, Jamie, we tried 20 times. The cover letter faxes without a hitch, but the death certificate and the obit will not fax. He's trying to tell you he's not gone. This is what they say. So now I go home, and again I have to fax the death certificate somewhere else, and again he hangs it up. So I say out loud to him now, I think you keep hanging this up because I keep forgetting that you are here with me. If I promise to try to remember, will you let this fax go through in its entirety? I cancel the fax. I feel suddenly this tidal wave of love pouring through me. I know it's his answer to me, the love. I heard you. Okay. I reissue the fax. It goes through. So I'm starting to realize now things are getting very strange when strangers who walk up to me didn't know me don't know me, didn't know my husband, they just walk up to me and they say, your husband says, tell our story. And they walk on. Now, another day around this time, I'm driving. And I suddenly feel the urge to pray to Jean on behalf of my friend Emily. Well, this is wild enough since having been raised an atheist, I never prayed. So I suddenly pray to him and I say, please help my friend Emily find love. Those those were the words of the prayer. I knew she had been lonely her whole life. 
After I say the prayer, I again feel that tidal wave of love. I look at the dashboard and I see that the time is 4.58. That night, I get a phone call from Emily. Emily says to me, Jamie, you will not believe what happened. I said, what happened? She said, at 4.58, I fell into a trance. And she said, your husband appeared to me. Now, she has never even seen a photo of him. But she described him to a T. And they'd never met either. So she said, she said, Jamie, he told me, quote, to find love, follow the gray stones to the church in your neighborhood. So he reissued the words of my prayer, repeating the exact words, help her find love, to validate his presence. And, of course, I guess to help bless Emily as well by sending her to this church. So now I go to my professional group in the city. She's a member of the group, and she tells the story. Another member of the group named Mitch Wood, a former seminarian, says to her, what was the name of the church that Jean sent you to? She says, oh, the Claremont Church. Mitch says, OMG. The Claremont Church is New York's only liberation theology seminary. Remember, Jean founded liberation (laughs) theology. So he put his stamp all over this manifestation. Now, I'm just going to give one more example, which involves a, a string of similarities. So early in my bereavement, I did a lot of crying. It was a hobby. And one day, I was on the floor of my closet crying. I tell about all about this in Love Never Dies. But the, the main thing is I'm thinking, I've got to call my friend Anne. No, don't bother her. She's working. After 20 minutes of my crying, in the distance, I hear the phone ringing. I pull myself up. I go to the phone. It's Anne. She says, Jamie, did you call? I said, no, Anne, but I was thinking I needed to talk to you. She said, Jamie, my phone rang and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. So we were so blown away that John managed to communicate his presence using the, this earthly prop in the case of, uh, this case was the phone. Earthly props are generally electronics. Now, a year later, I had a very bad cough. I could not breathe. And I'm thinking, I'm going to suffocate the way Jean did. So I say to him, Jean, I'm begging you, if you're here with me now, give me a sign that you're here. Do that caller ID phone trick. Do it now with my housekeeper, Donna. Two seconds later, my phone rings. It's Donna. She says, Jamie, did you call? I said, no, Donna, but I told her I asked Jean to call. She said, well, my phone rang, and your name and number appeared on my caller ID. So I was so flabbergasted by this. So now I go to my writer's group, and Gabe Davis, who is a devout Jewish atheist, has been listening to all Jean's manifestation stories and his phone tricks. And he says, you know, I sure would like to see Jean's phone caller ID trick repeated. And this time I'd like to see whether your phone's call log shows a record of having dialed out even though you didn't use the phone. So I forget about the challenge. It's a month later. I'm driving behind Gabe in my car, following him and his wife Robin to meet them for dinner. Suddenly... I feel that tidal wave of love again. And I look at the clock and I note it's 545. I get to the restaurant. Before I can get out of my car, Gabe rushes up to me. He says, Jamie, you will not believe what happened. What happened, Gabe? He says, at 545, my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID. Your name and number appeared. He said, I picked up the phone and a man's voice said, is Jamie there? Is Jamie there? He said the voice had an accent and prolonged the word there. Well, Jean was French, and he did prolong it. It sounded like there. He said it wasn't a real call. The voice just faded away. call never clicked off. He said, go get your phone. See if it dialed me at 545. So I dig into my purse. I hadn't used the phone all day. Sure enough, 545, my phone had dialed Gabe. So the purpose of all Jean's over-the-top manifestations are simply this. He asked me to tell our story. So these manifestations are for you and for everybody listening because as Jean said to me right after he left his body, Jamie, let our love shine like a torch that lights the path for others. So our story is meant to let you know that your loved ones are here with you too. They're just waiting for you to open the door of your heart and let them back in. Now, you talk in your book about dialoguing with the departed. Now, this I would think, especially for those who have been thrown the veil, if you will, the Mm -hmm, filter, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that takes steps, I would think, just like it took you steps to get into the belief 
process that you're in that might not allow you to see these signs and symbols that you experienced, for instance. And I thought that was a pretty intriguing story as I was reading a book about not being able to fax off a death certificate or even <laughs> the obituary. I thought, you know, but you hear about these kind of things and you can't just dismiss it as coincidence or a strange... Well, when it happens over and over. It, 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 yeah, it's too consistent to say, right. you know, that it's anything other than, hey, this right. is a reality really going on. But now, uh, let's talk about in your book how you talk about the steps that a person begins to take so right. they can start opening their okay. eyes and seeing the things okay. that they're missing. Okay, so here's the thing. If I can just take a step back for one second, because you alluded to the false beliefs, okay? The Absolutely. False religion. Okay. So part two of Love Never Dies helps you prepare for your own reconnection and your own dialogue by eliminating all the false teachings and all the inaccurate religious beliefs because if we don't if we don't put these to bed you will never be able to get to the point of being receptive recognizing the signs and dialogue you won't be able to do it so can i talk just a little bit about some of those to help people i think that's a very important for you to do that and i'll tell you why because one of the things you talked about was uh the christian religion that right. tends to look at death, then the soul goes off to heaven, and that's right. the end of it all. Right. Right. And I find it funny, uh, I sometimes pick on the Christian religion, because I, I, to me, what I see is this practice, generally speaking, going in the wrong direction, that if you're really teaching about Christ, teach about what Christ was really trying to teach us, which love. is to love. be love and love. manifesting miracles. Exactly. Not there hanging on a cross that. worrying about something as ridiculous as sin, but exactly. really manifesting miracles. Exactly. And I like that you brought that up, and I, and I was thinking, I want to talk to her about that, because that's one of those first things that if you buy into how it's commonly practiced, right, how it's, right, right. You know, then you can see where that veil or that block would be there. And exactly. I, it leaves me shaking my head sometimes. Exactly. Anyway. So remember how I said that the first night back he was quoting something to me? Right. And I didn't know what it was. Well, I'm going to come back to it because it segues perfectly with what you just said. So I went to see Jean's priest the following morning. I'd never met him because I didn't go to church. And I told him, you know, as we prepare for the readings for the funeral, I want you to know Jean is speaking to me and he's quoting something. So the priest looks at me like, yo, this babe has lost her marbles, right? But then when I told him what Jean was quoting to me, the priest blanched. He crossed himself and he said, Dear God, Jamie, at first I did not believe that Jean was speaking to you, but I do now. And then he said, you are quoting an obscure biblical passage from the communion of saints. Like I would have known. <laughs> I never read the Bible. <laughs> never went right. to church, right? Jean and I didn't talk about religion, at least not when he lived in the body. Now, it took me, two, it took me one whole year to understand why Jean quote, quoted that biblical passage to me. Because remember, he was a religious pioneer in life. He continues to be in the afterlife. And what I found out is the communion of saints says that our loved ones in spirit are one with or in communion with God and the saints. And since the Bible is telling us we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with God and the saints, it means the Bible is telling us we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with our loved ones in spirit because they are one with God and the saints. So the point John is making for all of us is what we've been told about the afterlife is dead wrong if you will pardon my pun. <laughs> We're not supposed to live in an emotional wasteland, separated from those we love, waiting until we quote-unquote die and enter heaven. Because Jean said to me, right after he left his body, Jamie, heaven is a state, not a place. Heaven is all around us. Heaven is here and now. So this means we're supposed to reconnect with our loved ones in spirit now. So that's a very important, important way that we must understand uh, the afterlife. Now, there's some other misconceptions that people have that really prevent you from going the step for, further to reconnect. May I share a couple of those as well? Yes, please do. I think the reason this is is you know uh, you know we're not a religious show, but we certainly respect and honor spirituality of all. Yeah. You know, and and the reason is is because we know as well as I'm sure you've come to learn is one size doesn't fit all, but it certainly is nice to have a lot of choices, isn't Egg. it? <laughs> and, and the thing is that anything that opens your door and your heart to love, that's where we're supposed to be going. I agree. And any kind of teaching that shuts down your opportunities to love and connect, that's messed up. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like we believe in serving others 
as a way to be able to express our life's special gifts. We don't believe in being enslaved to others, though. <laughs> right, 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 right. Anyway, go ahead. So here's another um, intense misconception. You know, I do a show called Love Never Dies on Hay House Radio, which, interestingly, is the most listened to hour on the Hay House Network, beating out some of the hugest spiritual names, including Van Prague, by thousands and thousands of listens, which just goes to show how much my story is reaching people and touching people. So this one I hear all the time. Well, you know, if you reconnect, you can't move on. (laughs) You hear that one. But it is exactly the opposite. When you don't reconnect, you don't move on with your life because you are so marinating in misery. How how can you live your life fully when you're so grief-stricken? But when you reconnect, as I help people to do every week on the radio, their grief transforms to joy, and now they're more able to enter their lives fully. Now, here's another one. I love this one. Well, you can't love another person if you continue connecting and loving your spouse or life partner in spirit. Well, this is also untrue. It would be like saying to a mother, you know, do you love your children? Did, you had a first child, right? Do you love her or him? Yeah, I do. Well, you can't have any more <laughs> because you only can love one. Uh, our hearts are made to love. We can love everybody who walks the earth plane and everybody who walks in spirit, okay? You know, and it's interesting, too. You remember the uh, this recent movie, I think it was called Her, uh-huh. with Joaquin Phoenix where his cell phone begins to fall in love with him? Oh, and she okay. begins to learn about love and becomes self-aware and starts loving everybody and was trying to say, look, love is boundless. Yeah. <laughs> and he exactly. was sitting there feeling all upset because at first she loved him and he was the only one, the center of the universe, but then she began to <laughs> see and understand and grow the full capacity of what love really was. And it was pretty yeah. astounding when you looked at it from that point of view. Absolutely. Now, here's another one. This one's a big misconception. Well, If you reconnect with those in spirit, you're preventing them from moving on. So again, they don't go anywhere. As Jean said, death is an illusion. There's a very thin veil between the realm where you are and the realm where I am. The veil is thinner than you can ever imagine. I'm standing right here. Where would I go? They don't go anywhere. So, And then when we talk about holding them back from moving on to do their holy work, their holy work is to support us, to love us, to guide us, protect us, and help us heal mind, body, and soul. So I heard John say early on, what else is there for me to do? It's my full-time occupation to love you. (laughs) And I hear this all the time from my patients and my callers, loved ones in spirit. Now here's another one. Well, you're going to open the door to the devil, evil, dark forces. Now, after Jean left his body, I found out that the Dalai Lama publicly prayed for him, naming him as one of the 50 human beings of all time who was one with God. I wow. This, right. Now, I mention this because this man never once spoke to me in our 27 years together about devils, dark forces, evil. It didn't exist. There is no such a thing. Devils and dark forces are nothing more than our own projections of our inner darkness that we don't want to accept, so we call it devils and dark forces. It doesn't mm-hmm. exist. Now, there are some presences that may be less evolved, but... We have something I call internal call blocking, spiritual call blocking. You don't want to take a call, don't take the call. Besides the fact, our loved ones in spirit are our gatekeepers, they're our protectors, and they they guard us against any evil forces if there is such a thing. I've never experienced it. So that's my answer to that one. And then um, part two of part two of Love Never Dies, I go into the science behind how this phenomenon occurs. And this helps people because I demystify the process. You don't have to be a mystic on a mountaintop. We're all born with the innate ability to send and receive energetic signals. And this is what we're talking about here in Love Never Dies. When, as Einstein said, energy cannot be destroyed. So when a being leaves his or her physical body, he is pure energy. When we communicate with that being in spirit, we are doing nothing more than sending and receiving energetic signals. That's all it is. And in fact, we energetically communicate every day of our lives, don't we? Like, think about it. You park at a light. You look over at a driver in the neighboring car. Doesn't that driver always look back at you? Why? He, he senses the energetic frequency of your gaze. How do twins know when the other's in trouble? 
even when they're living on opposite ends of the world. Energetic frequencies. How do close couples know what the other is thinking? Energetic frequencies. So essentially, what I'm doing here in part two is I'm bringing you all the latest science and I'm explaining to you how this all happens. And in fact, the quantum physicists now talk about our universe being comprised of, I think they say 90% of it is dark matter, which means it doesn't reflect or refract light. But the fact is, this universe, this dark matter, is where we believe the spirits reside. That's why Jean said, I'm right here. They're in the dark matter. So essentially what we're doing here is I'm showing you now, I'm coming to part three of Love Never Dies, how you can establish your own reconnection and dialogue. So all I'm doing is I'm showing you now how to tune to what I call the spirit channel in your brain and practicing tuning to it so that you can send and receive energetic signals with your loved ones in spirit. And I think what's important to note, too, is you were talking about uh, the barriers that we could have about the beliefs that we perhaps mm-hmm. were ingrained mm-hmm. with as we were growing up. Is, mm-hmm. As you mentioned uh, in the beginning of the program about without the use of mediums and middlemen, and, and mm-hmm. I always found that astounding, especially in my young adult life, as I began to sort of personally research and study religion and why we believe what we believe and the types of beliefs we have. And and I always wondered, you know, if God had created us, if that's what the story is here, then why is he putting all these middlemen in here who are telling us how to live? Shouldn't we have a yes, direct yes, connection? Yes. You yes. know? So Absolutely. I always found that funny. And here with the medium thing, even though perhaps some of those out there are really tried and true, although Houdini never found any, But the fact is, why do we need that middle person if the connection is really between us and that other person and not the middle one? I'm I'm glad you asked it because Jean said to me after he left his body that the church is big business. But by putting the fear of the devil in you and dark forces and saying you need a priest, only a priest can talk to God, only a minister can talk to God, and uh and saying you can't do it yourself means you have to come to church and you have to pay us your donations. So he's saying it's big business. Big business. And they don't want to cut out the middleman. This is what John told me. Oh, I believe that. (laughs) Yep, yep, yep. So, So here's the thing. I also wanted to say, this is also very cool. I forgot to mention this, and this is kind of important. One of the biggest things that um, the the official church party line and the Christian um, church party line is, well, look, even if you can talk to them for a brief time after they've left their bodies, notice I don't say dead, just they left their bodies. We don't die, right? So, But they'll say to you, once they're in heaven, they're out of reach. Now, I discovered this false belief when I went back to Jean's priest, and I wanted to tell him all about his ongoing manifestations. And the priest said to me, well, Jamie, get ready. When he's in heaven, you won't hear from him anymore. What, there are no cell towers in heaven? Or the signals from the earth plane can't reach And forget about heaven. omnipotence. Right? I mean, come on. I mean, these earthly conceptions are total misconceptions. Because remember, if heaven's right here in the dark matter, they don't go anywhere and they don't stop hearing us and we can't it's not that we can't continue to communicate with them so after the priest said this i come home and i'm bothered by this the whole day and finally i make the circle for my in-home group i run quite a few groups here and everybody is late except a new member named ashley i shut the group room door and ashley and i are alone and the next thing we hear is ding ding this is the sound that my front door makes when the burglar alarm registers that it's opened. And then we hear bang, 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 footsteps, right? And then they stop in the waiting room adjacent to my group room. So I say to Ashley, gosh, I think somebody's coming in thinking he has an individual session, not realizing I run a group now. Now we hear bang, 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 footsteps going in the opposite direction, and then ding, ding, front door opening. I said, excuse me, I've got to go see who this is. So in the two steps it takes me to go from the group room through the waiting room, to the front door. There is no way that somebody could have walked all the way down my really long driveway to my parking area, which is very far away, without my seeing him. I open the door. There's nobody walking. There's no car parked. I come back. I tell Ashley there was nobody there. She says to me, Jamie, it was a spirit. (laughs) So that was Jean's answer to the priest saying, well, when he's in heaven, you won't hear from him anymore. Jean's saying, did you hear those footsteps? (laughs) 
Now, wow. it's, it's, you know, taking a look at this subject is just so interesting because I think what it brings is something that we all really need to have is hope. You know, I mean, especially in your situation where you lost your husband, I remember as you were describing that wow. pain, you know, that you really feel a loss of hope. And I wonder in reflection oh, yeah. if you could share with us what do you think you gained from that experience as far as, I'm talking about the emotional pain. What do you think you gained as insights as now that you can kind of look back on it and you're not in it as much as you used to be? You mean <clears throat> insights as to the pain that we experience when someone leaves us bodily? Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've discovered, which is so important, and that this also does tie in to part three, okay? Part three is now I'm going to show you how to establish your own reconnection and how to dialogue, okay, and how to send and receive energetic signals. So the first thing that we need to do is be receptive. So I have in Chapter 1 of Part 3 of Love Never Dies, I show you how to create receptivity. Now, what I discovered was that when I was very, very bereft, it blocked my ability to send and receive energetic signals. You know, if you think about storms, atmospheric storms, how they block the sending and receiving of radio or TV signals, right? So our own atmospheric storms, when we're in grief, block us from sending and receiving. If you think about the image of a tunnel, right? You're driving through a tunnel, and you may have gotten a cell call, but you don't even know you're getting it. It doesn't register. Then you come out of the tunnel. Whoa, I got a cell call. So same when you're in the dark tunnel of grief. Your loved ones are sending you signals. You don't even know they're coming. You're so bereft. So... One of the things I show you how to do in the chapter on creating receptivity in Love Never Dies, one of the things I show you how to do is titrate your emotions so that you do not allow your grief to wash you overboard and prevent you from sending and receiving signals. So I give you, you know, specific steps on how to do that, and that's very important. And then I also show you all the other things that Jean showed me about what we need to do to be receptive to spirit. One of the first things, be still and quiet. He said to me, Jamie, the noise of the day drowns me out. Anytime you want to hear me, come to the bed and be still and quiet. So I show you how to create pockets of peace. And I'm not saying you have to convert your condo into a convent, but you need little moments of sitting in silence, turning off the TV, turning off the radio, and turning off the music, and just being still and quiet. Then I show you a particular breathing exercise to help you reconnect, because as Jean showed me, breathing is the way we bring spirit to us. Spirit is born on the breath. Then I show you how to use hypnagogic or twilight states. That's the state right before you fall asleep or right as you're awakening when we're more open to spirit. And I also show you how to use nature to help you connect with spirit. And then last but not least in this chapter, Creating Receptivity, I show you how to open up your five senses. Because remember I said spirit beings are pure energy. So they're able to energetically send signals to all of our senses. So the more our sensory receiver is turned on, the easier it's going to be for us to perceive the signs that are being sent our way all the time. Now, this segues into recognizing the signs because so many people say to me, I get calls on Hey House Radio, Jamie, I'm jealous of you. I don't get signs like you do. But then when they read the book, Love Never Dies, and they read my chapter on the signs of spirit presence, I can tell you, every single person writes me or calls me and says, I was wrong. I was getting signs I didn't know it. Because, again, freed from the human vessel, spirits are able to influence the material world in infinite ways. And their signs are infinite, nearly infinite. Sounds, like the footsteps, animals behaving oddly, like the chipmunk, strange physical sensations, drafts, temperature changes, chills, goose flesh, symbolic communications, butterflies, rainbows, and they also love to manifest coins that were minted on a year that was significant to us. For example, it was the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure, and my patient Kyla comes into my office, and I say to her, you know, Jean's been dropping a lot of coins on me that were minted the year he left his body. So Kyla blinks, and she says, oh my goodness, Jamie, I almost forgot. She points to her cowboy boots and she said, see these boots? They were off my feet in my bedroom when I saw a coin falling out of thin air landing in the boot and I knew it was for you and I forgot to take it out. I'm going to give it to you now. <laughs> so 
<laughs> and she turns her boot over. I hear Jean say, you'll see. It was minted the year I left my body. And sure enough, it was. So I want everybody to know being aware of the signs is often sufficient to begin the process of reconnecting. But now, you asked about dialoguing a couple of minutes ago. Here is where Love Never Dies takes spirit communication to an entirely new place. The CEO of Hay House said to me, Jamie, we've never seen anything like what you're doing here in Love Never Dies with the dialoguing, and they've seen it all. It's a woo-woo, you know, a woo-woo publisher. So, so what I show you how to do next in this part of Love Never Dies is how you can dialogue with the departed to reconnect to say goodbye to the physical body if someone was ripped from you due to sudden accidental death or illness, how to get guidance, and, of course, how to heal unfinished business and make peace. So I want people to realize that spirits dialogue with us in many ways. So in addition to communicating and dialoguing with us through dreams and mind melding, they also communicate with us using signs. But signs are a static form of communication where they drop a sign on us, like that John dropped the quarter on me. So, But we can also engage in a back and forth communication between us and spirit using signs, using human and animal open vessels, and using, using earthly props, which are various electronics. So can I give you an example of the difference between static signs versus a back and forth communication using signs and earthly props and open vessels. Absolutely, please. Okay. All right. So here it was this year, and it was the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure. I go to the chiropractor, and I'm alone in the office, and I tell Teresa this is the anniversary week, and the book is being published, and I'm giving my first public talk. I tell her all this, and I suddenly smell gardenias. I don't say a word. She looks up at me. She says, Jamie you smell gardenias? I said, oh, Teresa, that is so awesome. That is the scent of sanctity. So Jean is dropping a sign on both of us that he's here. He just dropped the sign. Now, I go back to my office, and I have a patient named Regina who desperately needs to reconnect with her sister in spirit. So I tell her the story about the scent of sanctity and that I smelled gardenias. With that, I hear Jean speaking to me, and I hear him saying, but I wish I could give you roses. Suddenly, Regina pops up off the couch. She says, Jamie, do you smell roses? <laughs> so in that really elegant manifestation, Jean used my patient as a, as a human open vessel to facilitate our dialogue. He was letting me know, you heard me right, I want to give you roses. He put the scent and the thought of roses in her mind so that he would corroborate that I had heard him right to facilitate our dialogue and also to let her know that she's pretty open to spirit and she can begin dialoguing with her sister. Now, I want to give one more example that's sort of like a fireworks finale of all, all the ways that uh, your loved ones can communicate with you using human open vessels and earthly props, which are, uh, in this case, computers. So it was this week, actually, last year, when I did the Coast to Coast show and Love Never Dies became an overnight bestseller and it sold out on Amazon. And the next day I get a call from a guy who says to me, Jamie, your husband is burning up my brain with messages for you. So he begins to tell me things in French and Italian. And I knew it was Jean speaking through him because these were things Jean used to say to me in French and Italian. So after the guy says something in Italian, he says to me, but Jamie, I'm a hillbilly. I don't know no Italian. <laughs> so I said, dude, I believe you. Your accent really sucks. So now a couple of days later, it's Valentine's Day. And he calls me and he says, I hope you're sitting down because what I'm going to tell you is going to freak you out. I said, okay, what? He said, I'm sitting at my computer today. My hands are in my lap. I'm not even touching my computer when I hear your husband say, send Jamie the photo of the peach-colored rose. Now, nobody on the planet knows. Not only did he give me roses every week, they were peach colored. The guy says that he looks at his computer and my husband opens up a photo of a peach colored rose and then he opens up the caption for the name of the photo, Peaches and Cream. Now, the night before, this guy told me, your husband says your time is now, to which I had replied, he always used to tell me the cream rises to the top, so peaches and cream. So 
here's the thing. These ways of dialoguing are magnificent, and the more you become aware of how your loved ones can communicate with you through human and animal open vessels, through signs that they bring to life, through earthly props, which are electronics, now Love Never Dies shows you to have a direct dialogue. So to talk back and forth, orally and in writing, to whatever end you require, to get guidance, because they are now your guides to help you travel down the bumpy road called life, to help you complete your spiritual development, to also help you heal unfinished business. So we use my meditation for making contact, and then we dialogue back and forth. I show you step by step how to do this. And then here's the thing I want everybody to know, to take heart. Because traditionally, in Western grief therapy, we're told, well, if somebody left his body before you worked it out, your SOL. But it is the exact Opposite. I want you to know you often have to wait until somebody has left his or her body in order to work it out. And it's because in spirit form they are more evolved and in spirit form they see how they screwed up. Now, I learned this one week after Jean left his body. I went to go get the car repaired. They didn't know me because Jean did the car thing. And I say to Debbie at the desk that uh, my husband just left his body. She says, oh, I'm a widow too. With that, I hear her husband beating down my door with a message for her. He says, tell her to stop making the same mistake that I made with our son because now she's creating the same power struggle. Now, this blew my mind. Not that he was speaking to me, but that he knew how he messed up and that he didn't know when he was in a body. And I say this to her, and she bursts into tears, and she says, it's all true. So that's why one of my patients said to me recently, I wish my father would hurry up and die so we can work this out. (laughs) (laughs) And now here's one more thing that everybody needs to know. They need our help to help them evolve spiritually. They cannot be in peace until we confront them on how they messed up. They can't evolve until they face where they've gone wrong. And they're not in peace until they know we've worked it out with them too. And I found this out on Good Friday. Jean sent me to Lainey, the bird lady. I didn't know her personally, but she had tried to help us save our little canary, Fluffy. And she was unsuccessful. So now I, it's years later, and I go to her bird studio. I walk in the door, and she says to me, Jamie, look at this little Gouldian finch in the cage by the door. You can see it's not looking good. And I look over. It's slumped over. It's about to keel over. And she said, this bird is going to be dead by nightfall. It hasn't eaten in two days. If it doesn't eat, it's going to be dead. So I say, can I try to help the bird? She says, if you want. So I go over to the bars, I lean my cheek against the bars, and I begin to energetically communicate with the bird. But I speak aloud so Lainey can hear. I say to the bird, I want you to go down to your seed bowl, and I want you to start eating right now. The bird instantly obeys, starts scarfing up seeds like a little mini vacuum. The more the bird scarfs, the better the bird feels. He's starting to chirp now and dance around. Now I hear... A woman, spirit, saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I was such a weakling, I didn't protect you from him. So I say this to Lainey, and she bursts into tears, and she says, this is my mother. She used to always call herself a weakling. So now I look down at the bird. The bird is looking sick again. It's craning its neck upward, and it stopped eating. So I realize there's another presence here that's really making this bird sick. And I become aware that this is a male presence. So I hear this male presence say, I am so sorry that I sexually molested you and I know you are still afraid of me. You're still like a little girl, scared of me. So I say this to her and she again cries and she says, I am still afraid of him and I have never worked it out. So we use my dialoguing with the departed technique to talk back and forth with him and she worked it out with him and of course the bird survived. So (laughs) now... Here's the neatest part of all. You have said so astutely, we're here to love. That's what it's all about. This is what our purpose on earth is, to perfect our ability to love ourselves and others. This is our love lab. This is our life. Now, I am living proof of the challenge. How do you love others fully when you don't love yourself fully? And I had such difficulty with this loving myself because I was raised in a family where I was physically and verbally abused. And 
I continued to hear my parents' mean voices putting me down in my head, even though Jean was so loving to me for 27 years, and even after he left his body. So I kept hearing it. So I went to my professional group, and I said, I've got to have them stop torturing me. It's ruining me. I, no matter how much success I have, it's never good enough. So they all said, well, just tell them to shut the F up and have our voices out, shout them. This never worked. Never worked for me. Never worked for my patients. So I go home. I collapse on my knees. And I pray to Jean, I'm begging you, please help me resolve this. And the next thing I know, he appears to me as the embodiment of love. He takes my face in his hands. He turns me toward him in the light. And he says to me, Jamie, listen, listen, listen to me. Let my love for you fully enter you. And in that moment, I realized why I needed to wait until he was out of the vessel of his body in order for me to be fully healed. Because now, the soul essence, his love, could enter me unimpeded. And in that moment, his love for me became implanted in myself as my own self-love. So what I say here is, that the most amazing way to fast-track your self-love is to reconnect with your loved ones in spirit. Allow them to heal every corner of your soul, mind, body, spirit, soul. Let them fill your heart to overflowing, and now you become a vessel that is overflowing with love, and then you can bring this love to the world, and that's Love Never Dies. Now, would it be fair to say that it brings you back to the essence of who you were just before or at birth? I would agree with you. See, now agree. there is an important Jesus Christ teaching. Ye can't enter the kingdom of God unless ye enter with the mind of a child. I agree with you. <laughs> Why aren't we paying attention to that? <laughs> I agree with you. You know, it's interesting. Jean used to say to me, Jamie, you are as open as a child. So, and he said, this is something that Jesus would say, you know, that you want to have that openness of a child. But even though I was open and I retained that, you know, open and innocent and unindoctrinated you know, quality, still I needed him to be out of a body for his love to fully enter me and return me to that state of purity, as you described, before I was so damaged in my <laughs> deformative years. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Now, I'll bet this has been very encouraging, became an overnight bestseller, this book, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, again, that are reaching out with mm -hmm. hope, because they also want to restore their faith, don't they? You know, the thing is, ultimately, faith is love. God is love. Because our loved ones are one with God and the saints, you reconnect with your loved ones, they are your intercessors to God. There's no separation. Mm hmm Yeah. Now, here's something, a couple of things as you were describing uh, these different things here kept coming to mind, and especially when it comes to how, well, let's just shoot straight here, uh, like, for instance, the show The Ghost Whisperer. Yeah. Does that seem to have some accuracy with what they portray on this show? You know that I don't know because I <laughs> the talk about sitting in silence. I do not watch television. So okay, I don't, okay, I don't fair know. enough. Fair enough. Because sometimes people, you know, take a look at shows like this and they wonder, you know, and, and and they are quite interesting in what they portray about how, you know, she's obviously an intuitive where they go to her because they know that she's the way they can directly communicate with who they want to. But this is you a know. fallacy. Yeah, this exactly. This is a fallacy mm -hmm. because I cannot tell you how thrilling it is for me every week, as I said on Hay House Radio, people call and they might have had a disconnection or unfinished business for decades. <clears throat> we use my visualization and my meditation for making contact, and they are dialoguing on their own with their loved ones in spirit in the short time frame of a small phone call. Now, of course, I also do live and virtual Love Never Dies retreats here at my home, and then people tune in over the Internet from all over the world. There I spend four hours with you, helping you heighten your receptivity and honing your ability to tune to the spirit channel, by the end of those four hours, people are really, really skilled. And then some of those people have even gone on to become my new transdimensional certified coaches, certified grief therapy coaches. And so we continue with that training and you just take it to the next level. It's like going to the gym. You know, at first you just lift a weight, you drop it on your toe. You practice, you get more muscle. 
same here. We're practicing and we're building our spiritual muscle. You can do this. We're all born with this ability. Because think about this. I never thought about this before, but I know this is so true. Nobody says you need a medium, a channeler, or a psychic in order to talk to God. You just get down on your knees, you're still and quiet, and you pray to God. You talk to God. You dialogue with God. Well, your loved ones in spirit are one with God. So you don't need an intercessor. Just talk to your loved ones as you talk to God. And you don't need an iPhone either. <laughs> no, I would say that that would be an impediment. The, the, um, the, the cell signals from your, your cell phone are definitely going to block the sending and receiving of spirit mm-hmm. messages. Although my husband does bring me um, signs and messages. I did a retreat last weekend, and after the retreat, I was driving to dinner, and an incoming text from Temple Hayes, the head of Unity Church, says, is this y'all taking over my computer? Well, actually, if you go to my website, AskDrLove.com, and you look at the top menu, Store, and then you drop down to Love Never Dies Experiential Retreats, you'll see I have a video on there of one of my retreats. And during the retreat, Jean literally took over my computer and posted an Eiffel Tower photo. And I was nowhere near the computer. and Everybody saw this, and it's captured on film, right? So this was a joke. He always was an imp, and he continues to be, as are your loved ones in spirit. They continue to be what they were. So I'm driving after last week's retreat to dinner when a text comes in, and it's from Temple Hayes, and it says, is this Shaw taking over my computer? (laughs) And I call her, and I say, Temple, did you text me? She says, no, I didn't. (laughs) <laughs> so he was just wow. playing with me. I did not. <laughs> of all people, Temple Hayes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, she actually sent me a movie since she's connected with me. He plays with her computer a lot. She sent me a movie of him moving the mouse all over her computer with her nowhere near it. Wow. Oh, it's, it's a wild ride. Pretty yeah. fascinating stuff. I'm so happy that you took the time to join us here on Beyond 50 again. These are always uh, interesting segments to do because of the possibility of the human spirit as well to be able to reach beyond what we believed, what we had learned to believe was, you know, of course, our, I guess, full expression when in fact we've become very limited because of all the rules and it's time to kind of break those things down and, and be embracing life. And it's because of stories like yours. Another one I wanted to bring up, uh, that we did about a year, two years ago, was the afterlife of Billy Fingers. I don't know if you're familiar with that story, no. but that's another doctor who did, who was kind of in the same frame of mind that you were growing up. And she had a bad boy brother who died, passed over to the afterlife, then came back to talk to her about it. Uh, we posted that up on YouTube. Fifty thousand views, close to it so far. And lots of dialogue going on there. Cool. May <laughs> so I give you, a gift to your listeners? May I? <clears throat> please do. Would you like that? So, well, because Love and Ever Dies sold out and there were no books to be had when I did the Coast to Coast, I, I ha- the first gift is when you sign up for the newsletter, you will receive the preface and the intro. And that helps you get started, you know, while you're waiting for the books. I had to do that when there were no books to be had. But now it's just a continuing gift to get you going. Then after you purchase the paperback, just send proof of purchase to my webmaster, webmaster at AskDrLove.com, and he will give you access to my Bigger Game Expo Talk where Jean made his first manifestation on camera. And that's really fun. You can't see it anywhere else. It's just a gift for my book purchasers. Well, very good. Well, Dr. Jamie, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us here on the program today and sharing with us this marvelous experience. I love being with you. You're great. You well, are great. Thank you very host. much. Really <laughs> like wonderful. I said, these are very interesting subjects that I think when people approaching midlife realize, you know, I've been doing things the way I was told to be doing them for years. I thought it was going to get me to where everybody said it would. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. And I'm going to start living life on my own terms. And this is one of those things that you wouldn't expect would come along that could be very inspirational helping you on that very path. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you again for joining us here on the program today. Lovely, and I'll talk to you soon. You betcha. Bye. Again, you can also discover more at AskDrLove.com is her website. You can also discover more at Beyond50Radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-news updates so you can stay involved in what's going on in Beyond 50 Radio. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.